Right. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, great to have such a good turnout, just over 100 participants. Um, we have a lot of, I think, interesting material to cover today. I'm a little biased, but uh, the question we're going to answer uh, hopefully throughout, um, hopefully you'll, you'll be satisfied with the answer you get to this question is, how is NTD data used in FTA formula apportionment? So how does the National Transit Database fit in um, to the FTA formula grant programs? Um, as Lori mentioned, I'm, I'm Joe Eldridge. I've worked with the NTD program in various capacities as a contractor for uh, the last 10 years. Um, as of now, I'm, I'm um, the operations center manager. So if you have any questions directed to the NTD program that go to your assigned reporting analysts, I work closely with all of those folks. I also liaise very closely with the program managers within the Federal Transit Administration's Office and Budget of Budget and Policy who oversee this whole program. Um, so i um, very excited too to be joined by Matt Bonzik and I'll, I'll give Matt a chance to introduce himself uh, when we get to, to the next section, but I'm gonna go ahead and begin. Hopefully you can all see the screen. As Lori said, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them during the webinar. If we don't get to them, uh, we'll have some time at the end as well. So a quick uh, disclaimer on what we're covering here, the contents of the, this um, presentation do not have the force and effect of law and are not meant to bind you, the public, in any way. Uh, the presentation is intended solely to provide you with clarity on existing requirements under the law or agency policies. So again, repeating our goal is to aid transit agencies and related stakeholders uh, in understanding how NTD data are used by FTA in funding uh, apportionment formulas. So um, these uh, related stakeholders, you might be one of them, include grant, um, grant managers, grant planners, uh, others in the grant administration process, um, uh, people within metropolitan planning organizations, and just others at the transit agency who are looking to understand how um, uh, NTD data that they submit fits into this program. So um, if you're outside of those groups, uh, that's okay. Hopefully there will still be some content to, to uh, review that will be useful to you. Our kind of four key objectives are reviewing um, specifically how to understand like uh, what data is collected and used in the formula programs and specific programs. So we're um, looking for both specific programs and at specific data points. Um, so we're also hoping to cover how the, the time frame works from submitting data to when FTA actually publishes the apportionment tables, which we'll take a look at as well. And we're hoping to provide you with some examples of apportionments by area. So using actual data was submitted, um, describe how that ends up turning into a dollar amount um, that's apportioned to an area, and then identify some additional resources that you could use to explore further and learn a little bit more about specific programs, or maybe it's about how this process works. Um, with that said, what we won't be covering today, um, th th there may still be important concepts to, especially to grant managers um, as listed here. And hopefully we got the handout in time with enough time to, to circulate. Thanks again, Lori, for doing that. Uh, but either way, we wanna make sure we cover this up front, just so if you have questions, you can hold on to them um, and we'll help you direct them to the you know, appropriate party within FTA. But we will not be covering how the split letters or local funding decisions work like within MPOs. We won't be covering how formula programs, which do not use NTD data, um, operate. Uh, we won't be covering the criteria for competitive or discretionary programs, nor will we be covering how to apply for grants. FTA has a lot of great resources on these topics online uh, on their website, transit.dot.gov. Okay, so again, the outline for the webinar won't spend too much more time on this. Before we dive in though, we have some kind of key terms we want to go over because there this is a can be a jargon heavy topic. Um, so we'll try to introduce these these concepts gently. Um, these are our plain language descriptions of the terms you're going to hear throughout the presentation. So the first is apportionment formula. So this is what uh, we're really here to talk about. So a formula is a procedure. It usually involves some math 
for splitting or allocating federal funding among states, tribes, or urbanized areas based on calculations specified um, in, by Congress in statute. Um, so when you hear us use the word apportions in this context to talk about how a fixed sum of grant funding is divided up um, and the specific amount being the apportionment. So this is important to contrast with the next term, which is federal funding allocation uh, or the federal funding allocation form. Now that's the form in the NTD that contains these statistics that are used um, for FTA to make apportionments. Um, and, and we're gonna go over what specifically those data points are, but the allocation task in this case is a little different. It's what the transit agencies, many of you do to split the the data among areas in which you operate or you serve. Uh, so this, this form is one of the sources of data used in the apportionment formulas. Appropriation, you're gonna hear of this term in a bit, is the fixed amount of money, as a, a fixed um, sum dedicated by Congress to certain funding programs for a given year. And then finally, urbanized area. This is an important term uh, because it, it um, defines how the the funding is, is split uh, in formula, in many of the formulas, uh, is a term um, that FTA uses in transit law, which means an area defined by the US Census Bureau, which has over 50,000 inhabitants. In the 2020 decennial census, there were 512 such areas, or we refer to them, abbreviate them as UCAs. Um, so this is uh, also an important caveat that Census Bureau publishes a list of what they call urban areas. Um, in transit law, the FTA is interested in um, defining an urbanized area, which is slightly different than the Census Bureau's list as any that have over 50,000 in population. Um, so we will cover a few examples of urbanized area and how they're receiving funding. All right, so a little bit more on the basics of formula apportionment. So FTA publishes tables each year, which provide the funding amounts that each state or urbanized area will receive from the given funding program. Um, in this case, this most recent year was the FY 2023, the federal fiscal year 2023 um, Consolidated Appropriations Act tables. So these are then administered as grant to each funding recipient. As I mentioned, these apportionment programs are what allocates the funds, what split the uh, funds based on formulas to those state governments and urbanized areas, who then have provisions and, and rules about how much to provide or, or dedicate to specific transit agencies or to specific transit programs within the areas or states. Um, so just to reiterate, each year there are legislation, there's legislation that appropriates funding after that happens, FTA is going to take two actions. One is to um, provide an overview of the apportionments and allocations based on these funds for the various programs, and then a statement of policy and guidance on public transit administration, so how the programs are administered. And they do that in the Federal Register. There's a link to both of these uh, notices at the end of the presentation. Um, the authorization is what basically gives um, Congress, the, the um, spending authority. So the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, which was enacted uh, in 2021, is commonly now referred to as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, this uh, authorization updates Chapter 53 of Title 49 of the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. So this is why you're, you'll see 53 at the beginning of most FTA funding programs. Um, specifically, the law reauthorizes through federal fiscal year 2026 funding from the mass transit account of the Highway Trust Fund for the formula programs we're going to talk about today. Um, so that, uh, that act, again, is commonly referred to as the bipartisan infrastructure law. So while this authorization did not include like major systemic changes to the structure of funding. There are new programs introduced. Some of the requirements are revised. Uh, more information can be found on the FTA website or directly in the law, which you can find on the congress.gov website. Um, the law also updates not only some key definitions and program requirements, but it also um, included a couple of new reporting requirements for the NTD program. 
We're not going to talk about those today because they don't really deal directly with the federal funding allocation statistics, but it's important to know that um, this law also regulates what gets collected and for what reason in the NTD, in the database. Um, finally, the, uh, the law establishes the formula funding levels available for each fiscal year. And the 100 billion, 108 billion total here is the max amount that could be appropriated over this whole period. The formula program itself start, started with around 13 billion, 300 million available in fiscal 2022, which scales all the way up to 14 billion, 642 million in fiscal year 2026. Um, and the FTA Administrator Fernandez recently pointed out this historic investment level in a recent release on April 13th of this year, which details the historic levels of funding for federal fiscal year 2023. Um, so again, the programs we're gonna discuss today are among those formula programs, um, but the amounts that, that come from NTD make up a, a smaller fraction. What the exact percentage is depends on the specific program, and all of that is defined again in the US code. Um, for example, the 5307 formula, which We'll discuss today comes from Title 49, U.S. Code Section 5307. Um, it's kind of laying out the landscape there. That is the largest formula funding program uh, under the the FAST Act, the previous authorization. Um, the the total amount from Table Three, which is the was the final um, apportionment. Uh, I'm sorry, the 2021 amount from Table Three, which was the final apportionment under the FAST Act, was around. 5.4 billion and the fiscal year 2023 amount, which is the most recently appropriated under the bipartisan in infrastructure law was around 7.1 billion. Um, again, more information you can find from the link here, which is transit.dot.gov slash BIL in case the link did not work right in the, the handout, we can also paste that in the chat. Um, we strongly encourage you that on that, on that um, homepage, there is a, a recording uh, that um, covers more about how funding might impact your agency and also covers in more depth all of the funding programs under the bipartisan infrastructure law. All right, so to reiterate, um, appropriations make the, the size of the pie that we're, we're going to talk about for each program fixed, uh, whereas the rules and the authorization, like Section 5307 that I just talked about, they are gonna define how the pie gets allocated among um, eligible recipients. So the result is the apportionment to each eligible area, eligible area or recipient. Uh, this is a really important concept for a formula program because um, as Matt is gonna demonstrate, the formulas themselves are a zero sum game. They can't be added to just by increasing the amount of service along one factor or um, you know, increasing the amount of data reported to the, to the NTD. The slices are dependent on the contributions from all of the eligible recipients in the formula. So um, in general, this is how the, uh, the, the formula works and what authorizes it, um, kind of the legal basis for it. We're gonna move now to talk about how the NPD specifically fits in. So I'm going to turn the screen over to Matt. And Matt, I'll let you do a quick intro as well. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, so my name is Matt Bonzek. Um, I'm the quality assurance lead for the NTD. I've been working with the NTD um, since 2012. Um, and Joe, can you confirm you can see the screen? We can see it. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so my, my job encompasses a lot of the diff different things, but one of the things that I work on is um, taking all the data that transit agencies enter in their FFA 10 forms and organizing that into uh, apportionment files that will allow the FTA to apportion the funds according to all the uh, fascinating things that we're learning today. So uh, to start, let me talk about the different funding programs that use NTD data. There are six of them. Um, the first three in this list, 5307, 5339, and 5337, um, provide funds to urbanized areas, so areas over 50,000 population. Uh, 5311 has a rural section that provides funds to states 
uh, for transit in areas under 50,000 population. Uh, 5311 has a, also a tribal component that provides funds to Indian tribes. Uh, and then the 5329 State Safety Oversight Program for, provides funds to states that contain rail transit systems. So uh, this flowchart uh, is based on the 5307 program uh, as it exists in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, there's a lot, as you can see. Um, we're not going to get into details of what all the tiny percentages are, but uh, what we want you to understand is that all these areas we've circled in red, um, these are areas where NTD data uh, determines how much funding goes to each urbanized area. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. So let's talk about an example. So we're going to talk about bus VRM over 1 million. And so if I go back to this thing, I have my handy pointer here. So we're going to talk about the bus tier, and we're going to talk about urbanized areas over 1 million. So we're going to talk about how the vehicle revenue miles, or VRM, um, feed into that formula. And so the example we're going to talk about is New York, New York. So the total appropriated amount in this tier for uh, 2023 was about 1.2 billion. And the total VRM in this tier across all the UZAs over a million across the country um, in NTD report year 2021 was about 2.1 billion. Now out of that 2.1 billion, about 312 million were in New York, New York. So if you calculate the percentage, that's about 14.6% of the total VRM um, is New York VRM out of the total VRM. And so if you take 14.6% of the total appropriated amount, then you get 177 million. And so that means that the New York UZA is getting $177 million just within that tier, within that um, red circle on the flow chart. Uh, it's important to understand that funding formulas are always applied at the UZA aggregate level. So FTA is not saying within New York, all right, the subway earned this much and the ferry earned that much. Um, FTA is taking the aggregate, the sum total um, of, in this case, bus VRM, uh, everywhere in that UZA uh, and applying the funding formula at that level. So I'd like to talk about incentive tiers now, and I can point those out on my, uh, my slide as well. Incentive tier, you've got a, an incentive tier here, and there's also an incentive tier here. So I want to talk about what those are. So both the 5307 and 5339 programs, that's the urbanized area program and the bus and bus facilities program, both have what are called incentive tiers. The uh, idea with the incentive tier is to measure cost effectiveness. So basically, um, whereas the, the VRM tier, vehicle revenue miles tier that we just talked about, um, is just based on vehicle revenue miles. So more miles, more money. In this case, what we're trying to measure is um, were you able to move a lot of people at a low cost, cost effectiveness? So it's calculated as passenger miles squared divided by operating expenses. And when we square the passenger miles, what that means is that large UZAs uh, proportionally benefit more from the incentive tier. Uh, because if, if it's squared, that means double the passenger miles earns four times the money. Uh, and you want to remember, uh, in the, this case especially, even more than vehicle revenue miles, that this is always applied at the UZA total level. Um, so just calculating passenger miles squared divided by operating expenses for a single agency or a single mode is not meaningful by itself. You need to look at the UZA total, total PMT for the UZA divided by total uh, squared divided by total operating expenses for the UZA. Um, I'd also note here that this is the one place that passenger miles comes into the formula if you're in a large UZA. Uh, so if you're a full reporting agency, you report passenger miles. 
Uh, this is why. This is why the passenger miles help you. Now, if you're in a small UZA, meaning under 200,000, um, then those two examples that we, we looked at, vehicle revenue miles and incentive tier, they don't apply to you. Instead, what applies to you is what we call the stick tier. Stick stands for small transit intensive cities. And the way that stick works is that it provides funding to urbanized areas um, when they operate above a certain threshold level. And the threshold levels are defined by the average of all urbanized areas between 200,000 and 1 million in population. So basically the idea here is that if you're in a small urban area, but you provide transit at a rate that is greater than the typical rate for medium-sized urban areas, um, then you're gonna get a funding bonus for that. Uh, there are six stick factors. Uh, so each small UZA earns anywhere between zero and six. Uh, you can earn any number of them. And four of those factors are per capita. So that's vehicle revenue miles per capita, vehicle revenue hours per capita, passenger boardings, or what we would normally call unlinked passenger trips or UPT uh, per capita, and passenger miles per capita. And then there are also two that are based on what you might call usage rates. So that's passenger miles per vehicle revenue mile, passenger miles per vehicle revenue hour. And the thing to notice here is that three of these six factors use passenger miles. So this is sort of an incentive if you're in a small UZA and you're not sure if you want to do the full report or not. Um, only full reporters report passenger miles. So only, uh, only if you're a full reporter are you going to contribute to your UZA, potentially earning three of those six stick factors. So the stick thresholds, this is for fiscal 2023, which is the most recent year that's available. Um, each factor was worth about half a million dollars. So it's a, it's a sub substantial amount of money. Um, there were 320 small urban areas and 127 of those. So a bit, a bit less than half uh, qualified for at least one stick factor. Um, so these are the six stick factors. The thresholds are listed here as well. Uh, and then you can see some of them, you know, VRH per capita is pretty commonly earned, PMT per capita pretty uncommonly earned, uh, probably because there are a lot of uh, reduced reporters not reporting passenger miles. The stick thresholds do change every year. So every year we recalculate based on um, the service reported by medium, uh, medium sized UZAs. Um, so you've got a, a little time series here that you can see. And what you can see is that every year they do change, um, but not that much. So if you're trying to estimate whether you're going to earn a stick factor in the coming year, um, looking at the stick threshold from the last available year is a, a pretty good, if not a perfect, uh, guideline that you can use. So let's look at an example of how this works. Uh, so we have a, a fictional UZA, although the, the numbers are from a real UZA. I won't tell you which one. Um, so this is the Anytown UZA. It has two agencies, which are called Anytown Transit and Village Shuttle. Um, Anytown Transit has a bus and a van pool. Village Shuttle has just a bus. And so we want to see whether Anytown UZA has earned the passenger miles per vehicle revenue mile stick factor. So what we're going to do is get the passenger miles, vehicle revenue miles uh, from everyone who operates in that UZA. We're going to add them all together. So the final row, you see the UZA totals for passenger miles and vehicle revenue miles. We take the ratio, passenger miles divided by vehicle revenue miles, we get 3.9. And if we look back on the previous slide, we can see what the threshold for PMT per VRM was. It was 5.52. So we're below the threshold. So any town did not earn that stick factor in this uh, this year. They might have earned other stick factors. They might earn this stick factor in a different year, but for this year, they were under the threshold. So they did not get that stick factor. 
All right, so that was 5307. Um, that's probably the most complex uh, program that we have. I'm gonna talk briefly, look, briefly about 5311, which is the rural program. Um, and you can see here on the left, we have apportionment to states. Um, so this is the rural 5311. And then over here, we have the tribal 5311. What you can see is there's a lot fewer uh, red circles on this one than there were on the 5307 flowchart. Um, just VRM here, VRM here, and VRM here. Um, so NTD data has less influence over this formula than it does over the 5307 formula. So if you're in a, uh, a state non-urbanized area, not a tribe, then the only place that NTD data affects your apportionment is right here. Um, and it's only vehicle revenue miles. I'm gonna zoom in on the uh, tribal component briefly because it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so we have the vehicle revenue miles right here. Um, half of the, the formula is based on vehicle revenue miles. Um, so for tribes, that's a, that's a significant um, impact that vehicle revenue miles have on the apportionment. Um, and that works just like vehicle revenue miles in the 5307 program. It's just um, split among all vehicle, vehicle revenue miles within that tier. Um, and then we have the second tier here that's a little bit more like the stick because it's based on a threshold. Um, but it's a little simpler because the threshold never changes. So the threshold is 200,000 VRM. If you're over 200,000, you get that, uh, that tier, that bonus. If you're under 200,000, then you don't. So the, the 200,000 threshold doesn't change from year to year, um, unless at some point in the future, Congress changes the formula. Uh, and then the third tier is based on low income individuals. So that's based on the census. Okay, 5339 is the bus and bus facilities program. Um, this tier is, or this program is very similar to the 5307 formula. Um, just like 5307, we have vehicle revenue miles, uh, over a million, under a million, and then we also have an incentive tier. 5337 is the State of Good Repair program. Um, this program, uh, first of all, it's important to understand only includes uh, vehicle revenue miles and directional route miles on guideway over seven years old. Uh, so the idea is basically once it gets to a certain age, it needs to be maintained to remain in a state of good repair. So magic number is seven years. So once it's seven years old, FTA will start funding you to, um, to maintain this guideway. Um, I'd like to talk about the difference between the two tiers here. So we have on the left, the fixed guideway tier, and on the right, the high intensity motor bus tier. So the difference between those, fixed guideway is any rail, ferry, bus rapid transit, automated guideway, aerial tram, or trolley bus. Those are all modes that you report uh, to the NTD. Um, I should also note that trolley bus in this case means um, a bus that receives propulsion power from an overhead catenary, um, like a streetcar. It does not mean a bus that is styled to look like an old timey trolley. Uh, so fixed guideway is any of those modes. Um, bus, regular bus can also be fixed guideway. Um, if it's on a bus lane, that allows only buses uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's the fixed guideway tier, the tier on the left. Tier on the right is high intensity bus. And high intensity bus is either HOV lanes that are used by buses or bus lanes that are not 24 seven. So bus lanes that allow um, non-bus traffic at certain times of the day. So let's talk about this seven year rule. What, do we, what exactly do we mean when we say seven years? So you become eligible for a state of good repair program when the segment was first reported to the NTD at least seven years earlier. And so let's run through an example of what that means. So let's say that service on the segment started um, before October 1st, 2017. 
Now, federal fiscal year 2025 will start seven years after that. So it starts on October 1st, 2024. Uh, the federal fiscal year 2025 apportionment is based on NTD 2023 data. So the data that you report to the NTD um, on your fiscal year 2023. So that means that the agency reports um, data on segments greater than or equal to seven years on the FFA 10 form in report year 2023. So it sort of seems like a six year rule in that sense. The service started in 2017. You're reporting it to the NTD 2023. The reason for that is because your data is being used for a future year funding formula. So it's not about what's seven years old now, it's about what's gonna be seven years old when this data gets used to apportion funding. Okay, and finally, we have the 5329 program. Um, this is rail modes only. Uh, it uses passenger miles, vehicle revenue miles, and directional route miles. Uh, as well as the number of rail fixed guideway public transportation systems within each state. Um, and so these funds go to the state uh, so that the state can fund safety oversight programs. Okay, so those are the, the formula programs that are using your NTD data. Um, so I'd like to talk about what we call apportionment unit factors. And a, a unit factor is basically one slice of the pie. Um, and so the more service you operate, the more slices of the pie that you get. We're talking about funding here. So unit, unit factors describe the dollar amount per factor that your urbanized area or state earns. And these are useful because they're uh, an easy way to approximate what your UZA will earn per unit of NTD data reported. Um, it's important to understand that the funding formulas that Congress creates do not set the unit values. So Congress doesn't say like every, every vehicle revenue mile you operate is worth 50 cents. What Congress says is like we saw in the New York example, here's the total amount of money that we're putting into this formula. Um, divide that by the number of vehicle revenue miles operated all across the country and you'll see the amount per mile. Um, also important to understand the unit factors that FDA publishes are based on last year's apportionment. So right now, 2023 is the most recently published apportionment. Um, so next year, the, the appropriation will be different and the service, service provided will be different. So the unit factor will be different as well. Uh, but they do tend to be fairly consistent from year to year. So they're a, a reasonable way to estimate uh, how much your service is worth in the funding formulas. So just a few examples. These are not all of the, the unit factors. It's uh, just meant to be an illustration, but you can see that um, some of them come from the census. So per person comes from the census. And that changes based on the size of your urban area or if it's a rural area. Um, there's also perfect Skyway DRM, directional route mile, $50,000. Um, this is why I'm such a stickler and such a pain in the butt for you all when you try to report directional route miles, try to add segments to your report, because uh, each one is worth $50,000. So we're, we're very careful to get those right. Um, each stick factor, like we said, is worth about half a million. Um, bus vehicle revenue miles are worth different amounts depending on which formula, which formula is used. Um, 5307 is worth more than 5311. So these are just a few examples. If you want the complete set, you can find it online. Um, we've got this link here. We're also going to have this link uh, again at the end of the presentation. Um, you open up what they call table five within that link. You'll see something that looks like the screenshot here. Um, I've only got the top section here, so you can only see the bus tier uh, of 5307. Uh, if you open up the file, you'll see the whole thing. And so you can see on each row, they've got a, a different part of the formula, population, population times density, bus, vehicle revenue, miles. And then over on the right, they tell you how much it's worth, how much each one is worth. 
So let's look at an example. It's the same example we looked at earlier, but it's going to be easier to do the math this time. So this time we're going to say, all right, New York, New York, um, the bus vehicle revenue miles was 312 million. According to what we just looked at, the unit factor value is about 57 cents. So we multiply those together and figure out that those bus VRM are worth $177 million in the formula. Okay, so we're gonna change gears here a little bit. We're gonna talk about your NCD report, how we collect these data and sort of how the pipeline works from collecting the data to um, apportioning the funding. So annually, you fill out a federal funding allocation statistics form, uh, what we call the FFA 10. And that form directly feeds into a future apportionment. On that form, you split the data across the urban and rural areas that you serve. And you have some discretion to allocate the data within the bounds of what we call the serve rules. And you can get into lots of detail on that within our, our reporting manual. Um, I'm not gonna go into that detail here today. I should note there are also a few manual adjustments that can take place to the data from the FFA 10 form. Um, those are pretty uncommon, so I'm not gonna get into detail on that. All right, so the time frame. Um, NTD data gets collected after a fiscal year ends. Um, it then gets validated by uh, me and people on my team. Um, because the data collection is not finished by the federal fiscal year end, the data is not ready to use for the next federal fiscal year. So instead, um, it gets used in the report year plus two. So for example, 2022 report year gets used in 2024 apportionment. So we'll, we'll run through a specific example of the timeline here. So here we're gonna talk about uh, fiscal 2023 NTD data. So this is your agency's 2023 fiscal year. Um, it may start, depending on your fiscal year end date, may start as early as April of 2022, and it may end as late as December of 2023. So all, the, all during that period, you're collecting data, you're operating transit service, and then at the end of that, you have to complete the NTD report. And so we we uh, make NTD reporting available usually in September. So that would be September 2023. Um, so you get usually four months after your fiscal year end, sometimes more than four months. Um, you complete that report. Um, the program support team, that's us. Uh, we validate the data. And then July 2024 is when we have to have everything wrapped up for that year. In August and September of 2024, um, FTA puts together the apportionment files, uh, does all these calculations that we've been talking about. And then at some point after September, um, FTA will publish the apportionment tables for fiscal year 2025, uh, which is the year that starts on October 1st, 2024. Um, I should also note that the apportionment tables that FTA publishes may be full or partial, and that depends on how much Congress has its act together. Um, so that doesn't bode well, does it? So if Congress has, has the full budget for the year, then FTA can release a full year apportionment uh, table in the fall of 2024. Um, but if Congress only has a continuing resolution that covers maybe half the year, then FTA has to publish a partial year apportionment. And so if you if you open up the apportionment tables and you say, hey, that's way less than it's supposed to be, check whether it says it's partial year um, before you panic. If it's partial year, that means don't change the, the channel. Um, there's more funding coming but just as soon as Congress is able to appropriate it. Okay, so this is an FFA 10 form. Um, this is what it generally looks like. Some of them are simpler than that. Uh, the form basically rearranges it itself based on um, what mode you're reporting and whether you have fixed guideway or not. So you can see each row uh, represents a data point. We have rows for annual total. Um, we have rows for just 
the fixed guideway portion, rows for just the non-fixed guideway portion, and then rows for just the state of good repair, so just the portion over seven years old. Um, the columns, you have a column here for data from other forms, so this gets automatically calculated based on what you have on the rest of your NTD report. Annual total column is automatically calculated based on the sum of your columns on this form. Um, allocated percentage, if, if you're done with the form, this should all be 100%. Um, so this is just here to help you make sure that you've allocated all your data. And then this is where the action happens. So this is urbanized area number three. Um, your urbanized area will be different, but the idea is this represents one of the urbanized areas that you serve. So this is where you report the data. If you serve multiple urbanized areas, then over to the right, there will be more columns um, with different UZA numbers. Okay, so if you're in a large UZA, over 200,000, then there's a lot going on on this form for you. Um, you're gonna get funding in the fixed guideway tier of 5307 for everything you put here, your fixed guideway directional route miles, fixed guideway VRM, PMT, and OE. Remember these get used in the incentive tier. And then for non-fixed, you have the bus tier within the 5307 program, as well as the bus and bus facilities program. And so non-fixed VRM, PMT, OE, those all go into that formula. And then if you have segments that are more than seven years old, you also get 5337 uh, funding based on what you put um, on these rows. If you're in a small urbanized area, so between 50 and uh, 200,000 population, then none of that applies to you. You just get the stick within 5307. Um, so the stick factors are going to be calculated based on vehicle revenue miles, vehicle revenue hours, passenger miles, and unlinked passenger trips. Uh, and then you you are still eligible, eligible for um, 5337 state of good repair as well, if you have anything there. If you're in a rural area, then only one thing on this form matters, and that's the vehicle revenue miles, the total. So let's look at some specific examples. Okay, so the scenario here is that you're a large UZA. You have a van pool program that operates in the UZA, but it's not currently reporting to the NTD. So you're thinking, well, what if we wanna get these into the, into the NTD? How much funding is that going to add for my urbanized area? So um, what you should do you're a large UZA, so VRM, PMT, and OE are what matters. And we've got a column here that has the current data, so the data that does not include Vanpool. You've got the Vanpool stats here. And then if you add those together, you get this hypothetical scenario where you're reporting the Vanpool. In this column, we have the unit factor values from Table 5, um, 5307 VRM, incentive tier, then 5339, the same things. So what we do is we just take the total VRM, multiply it by the unit value, and we get an estimate for the funding generated by that data point. We, again, we calculate PMT squared divided by OE, multiply it by the unit value, figure out what the incentive tier is worth as well. So we do that all the way down. We get the total funding. Current scenario is about 19 million. Do the same exercise over here, including the van pool data. And we see we get about 22 million. We get about 3 million more. So things to notice here first are that we're looking at the total urbanized area. We're not looking at what would be in this column. We're not looking at uh, van pool by itself. We're looking at the total UZA without total UZA with. Um, the other thing I want to note here is that I'm not saying that you owe the van pool operator $3 million. Um, the way that your urbanized area splits the funding among um, everyone who reports to the NTD is totally up to you. 
it's not required to be based on NTD's funding formulas, or excuse me, FTA's funding formulas. So here's another example. So in, in this example, you're in a small urbanized area. So in this case, it's the stick program that you need to simulate. So the strategy is very much the same. We're taking the aggregate of all the data across the entire UZA. Um, so here we calculate the aggregates of all the, uh, the four data points. Uh, then we add in the van pool stats, see what the new uh, simulated aggregates are. And then we calculate the stick factors. So here are the calculations of the six stick factors in the current scenario. And then here we have the stick thresholds. So these we looked at earlier in the tables when we discussed sticks. So these come from um, table six. Um, which is in the, the same link as table five, just below table six, tells you the stick thresholds. And so for each one, we compare the ratio for your urbanized area to the threshold. If it's under the threshold, like this one, you didn't earn that stick factor. If it's over the threshold, like this one, you did earn that stick factor. And we do that in both scenarios. And what we see is in both cases, you earn the same stick factors. So in this case, adding the van pool did not earn you any extra funding. Okay, so we're almost through here. Um, wanna talk about resources and then a conclusion. So first of all, um, just some general information about grant programs. Um, every time there's a new reauthorization, there are changes to the rules. Um, so I encourage you to, to try this website here on the bipartisan infrastructure law that'll um, give you the most up-to-date information on the, the current authorization, which is good through 2026. Um, some links here um, to first just general information on apportionments, um, and then very specifically the uh, current year apportionment tables. So that table five with all the data unit values table six with the stick. Um, that's all found right here. Um, we have a link to the Federal Register notice that announces the 2023 apportionment. And then all those lovely flow charts that we showed you um, can be found on this link. Uh, we did not make those ourselves, thank goodness. Uh, some more resources. Um, if you want to look at the underlying data, um, this link will show you what all the NTD reporters reported on their FFA 10 forms. Um, so you can look at uh, what's going into the formula for your urbanized area. You can also look at archived apportionments, so 2022 and, and earlier apportionments, uh, and then some general resources that FTA has published on funding and finances. After the funds have been apportioned, uh, the NTD doesn't know anything about them. So if you have questions about how do I apply for a grant? Am I allowed to spend my, my grant on this or that? When am I gonna get my funding? Um, those are all questions for the FTA regional office. Um, if you don't have contact information for your regional office, you can find it at the link here. Um, if you need support, uh, first we have a non-technical um, help desk. So this is, um, well, first of all, I should say your, your first point of contact should always be your NTD analyst. Uh, your analyst knows more about your agency than, than anybody else on the, on the team does. So try them first, but if they're not available, uh, then we also have the NTD help email, uh, which is staffed by analysts. So they should be able to, to help you with your question. Um, if you have technical um, questions, so your having trouble logging into the NTD or you're experiencing a bug on your NTD report, um, then you should try the FTA IT help desk. Um, they'll be able to, to open a, a ticket and, um, and get your issue resolved. Um, if you wanna contact any of us, uh, I'm there. Uh, Bailey Krause is another person who helps out with apportionment issues. Um, Chelsea Champlin is the NTD program manager. Um, and then, Joe's email is there as well. So I'm sure there are no questions because everything we went over is very simple. Um, but just in case, 
we will take questions at this time. I'm here to moderate them as well. So if you want me to do that. Thank you, Lori. That'd be great. Okay. Well, it looks like the open questions are not really questions. Although there is a from Dilly. I'm sorry if that's wrong. Uh well, they're looking for content. It says seems this webinar doesn't cover every doesn't cover allocation of funds to facilities supporting the transit systems based on their condition reported in FTA form A15. Is there another webinar or website that has the content they are looking for? So I don't think there's any funding formula that actually uses the condition of the facilities. Um, FTA uh, collects condition on facilities basically as a, a data resource. Um, not as a, a basis for allocating funding. Um, so we do encourage you to be as accurate as possible with those conditions, but um, they won't affect your, your formula apportionment. Thanks. Um, whoops. I didn't answer. Okay. Happy DeLuca said, our company is located in a rural area in Nevada, across a river from an Arizona town that is being required to merge into a UZA. How would this affect us? So if you operate in that urbanized area, um, then you would be potentially eligible for uh, funding related to that urbanized area. Uh, but that would depend on how that urbanized area chooses to split its funding. Uh, so that's that, that split letter that, that Joe mentioned, that's a local decision. Um, in terms of your NTD report, again, if, if you serve that urbanized area, then on your FFA 10 form, um, you would allocate an appropriate amount of data to that urbanized area. And so those data would then go into the, the funding formula for that urbanized area. I'm guessing that's Bullhead City. Is that the one in that area? That, I, I may, may or may not be remembering that right. But um, basically what I would encourage you to do is... Um, talk to the MPO for that area and talk to your FTA regional office um, and they'll be able to give you a better idea of whether you have funding opportunities there. Great. Looks like Kathy confirmed it is. Both yeah. Heads, so that's, yes. that's exactly right. All right. Said yes. 10 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm Slytherin, so. <laughs> um, Mike asks, in the example given during the presentation with adding van pool service, is it safe to assume that the funding apportionment would grow only if all other transit systems stats in your size slash grouping stay the same? So I guess, so that's an interesting question. So it's a question about how um, the total appropriated amount uh, gets split among all the operators within that tier. So that means if, if everyone grew the exact same amount, so every single urbanized area grew 10% uh, in terms of their service, then everyone would get the same percentage as last year, right? Um, but that's not likely to happen. So um, basically, if, if your urbanized area adds service at a rate that's higher than the rate across the whole country, um, then yes, you would get a, a larger share. Um, in general, if you if you're adding new services not reported before, then um, that's usually going to result in a higher apportionment amount. Of course, that's not a guarantee. Um, but I would also point out that you know. It, you're not just competing against other urbanized areas, you're sort of competing against yourself. Um, so, you know, you're, you need to look at the scenario of how much am I gonna get if I don't report this versus how much am I gonna get if I do report this? Um, so it's, it's usually to your advantage to report more service. Um, I guess the, the exception there would be, like we looked at with stick, if you're a small urbanized area, um, you can increase service, but if it doesn't get you over a stick threshold, then um, it's just academic. It doesn't get you extra funding. 
Thank you. The next question is from Ann Simpson. Uh, 5311 apportionments. Are the formulas presented used to determine how much each state DOT receives for the 5311? Does each state then decide how to allocate the funds among rural agencies slash providers? Yep, that's exactly right. That was a quick answer. Yep. <laughs> Um, Jean asks, where do we find the latest population figure at the UZA level? Ah, great question. Um, so the reason that's a great question is because there is a new census. Um, the 2020 census data for urbanized areas just got published uh, earlier this year, I think in January, might've been the end of December last year. Um, so that's a link that we should provide. Uh, Joe, do you have that handy? Yes, I just typed it in response to the answer. I'm sorry, I think I cleared the answer when I did that. So I'm also going to put it in the chat. Oh, yeah. Joe, Joe pasted a, a link. I can see it. I don't know if anybody else can see. I might have to hit done for it to show up in the answered questions tab, actually. But I just put it in the chat, too. So the, towards the bottom, or I guess towards the middle of this page, there is a list of 2020 census urban areas. Uh, there's one that's sorted by state. So you can view it either way, both of those files were the population data. And those are the same ones we're using for NCD, but only for the areas that are 50,000 or more populated. Great. The next is from Matt Deal. Does a system-wide <clears throat> redesign that includes many of the same routes as before the system redesign reset the proverbial clock for state of good repair funding? No. Uh, that's another good question. So um, when we're talking about segments um, for state of good repair, um, the segment is is basically the physical corridor. Um, so it doesn't matter which routes are using that segment. Um, as long as it continues to be used, the route that actually uses it can change. That does not reset the clock. The clock just, it started when that segment first came into service. Um, and so once you reach seven years past that point, um, that segment will remain eligible for state of good repair uh, for as long as it's being used. Next, Dave Summers wants to know, is any formula apportionment, apportionment affected by fares or quote, fair units? Is there an impact on our UZA formula if a transit operator decided to stop charging fares? No, uh, no impact from fares. Um, I think there, there may be some effect from fares dealing with, um, how much operating assistance you're eligible for. Um, that's a bit outside my, uh, area of expertise. So I, I would talk to my grant or my, um, regional office about that. But in terms of the formula apportionments, fares are, are not, uh, are not one of the variables that we use at all. Okay. Uh, Joey Penkert asks, when seeing if you meet the threshold for STIC, STIC, would you add MB and DR numbers together for your agency in each category and divide by capita to see if you meet the STIC threshold for each category? So the important point is that um, the STIC factors are calculated for the urbanized area as a whole. So you would first add together, um, just to, to use VRM as an example, add together the VRM for all of your modes, as well as any other agencies that operate in that urbanized area, um, and then divide that total by the urbanized area population. Um, Michael? asks, would a van pool program for a major employer that is a nonprofit be a reportable service? We are basically a company town. Yeah, I see. So um, van pools are reportable if they are open to the public, first of all. Um, so even though it's a company town, uh, somebody who works for a different company would have to be able to join the van pool. Um, and then the van pool has to have what we call a public sponsor. Um, which means either there's a, a public transit agency that's contracting for the van pool service or a public transit agency basically writes a letter that says 
um, you know, we, we certified that this service is helping to meet the, the transit needs of our area. Great, and the last one for now is from Tan Kohler. How do we receive the state of good repair funds? We are a reduced reporter. So I, I think that's more of a question for the regional office. Um, we don't really handle sort of the, the outgoing funds uh, on our team. So I, I would encourage you to, to reach out to your regional office. But in terms of the, the statistics coming from the reduced report map into the 5337. Mm, okay, yeah, you're yeah, you're right. So there is something I can say about that. So if, if you're a reduced reporter, um, then you don't report fixed guideway or high intensity segments. Um, the, those areas of the report are not available to reduced reporters. Um, so you would not be able to generate uh, state of good repair uh, funds in the formula. Uh, in order to generate those funds, you would have to complete a full NTD report. That's it for open questions. I guess we can wait another minute or so, see if anybody has anything else, is typing madly. I would like to note that I put the link to the survey in the chat box in case anybody wants to take it. I will also be emailing it um, around later today or tomorrow. Not, not too long, so you don't forget what you're even evaluating. Um, I don't know. People are leaving, <laughs> and there's no more open questions. So um, do you have the last slide with email address? Oh, no, this is the last slide. OK, I don't know if you had your contact. In case th there we go. Um, again, this is in the handouts. If you want to refer to that, at, you know, a couple of days later and you say, oh, I thought of a question, you should have all this information. Um, I think that's it then. There's no more questions. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. Um, Joe and Matt, thank you. Informative, great presentation as always. As I said, uh, I put the survey eval in the chat but i will also be emailing it so no rush to do that and um i think that's it thank you everybody thank, Have a good afternoon. thank you all and thank, yeah, thank you laurie take care everybody bye bye